This is the Parsons Gates building at Caltech. In numbers, it frequently appeared as the supposed office building of the hero. We're starting a series of four mini lectures on the G protein pathway. This is an amazing and important pathway in neuroscience. I'll give you an overview. It starts with a receptor on the cell membrane. We then activate a G protein. There are four major types of G proteins, but many minor types. This in turn, in turn activates an effector, which can be either a channel or an enzyme. This in turn activates an intracellular messenger, usually either soluble calcium or a cyclic nucleotide, primarily cyclic AMP. This often activates a kinase, another type of enzyme. The kinase phosphorylates a protein, and if the pathway goes on long enough, the phosphorylated protein goes into the nucleus and activates genes. Now these lightning bolts occur at three places in the pathway because those are the places where high energy phosphate groups are transferred from either ATP or GTP to a protein or from one protein to another. Now we start this story with the proof of chemical synaptic transmission, which was done by the great physiologist pharmacologist Otto Loewy at the University of Graz in 1921. Indeed, many details of G protein pathways were discovered for neuronal control of the heart. It had been known for many years that if you electrically stimulate the vagus nerve, which runs from the head to the heart, the heart slows down or stops beating. So here's a, a schematic of two wires stimulating the vagus nerve. In German, it was called the vagus nerve, which means wanderer. Now, the experiment that Utter Loewy did was to connect two frog hearts to the same bucket of ringer's solution. Here's a little bit of oxygenation to keep the ringer's solution fresh. And he took the output from the first heart, the solution flowing through the first heart, and applied it to the second heart. And Otto Lurvi used the most advanced physiological recording technique available at the time, the smoked drum. So here are two levers, and they are scratching the smoke off this drum. And sure enough, when Otto Lurvi stimulated the frog heart A, it stopped beating. But a little while later, heart B also stopped beating. So this interesting experiment said that there was a diffusible substance moving from heart A to heart B, that the diffusible substance had presumably stopped heart A and was now stopping heart B at the same time. This experiment involves lots of controls and lots of do-overs, etc. But the basic principle is this diffusible substance. Now, those of you who are German speakers will know that a diffusible substance or substance is often called a Stoff. And so uh, Otto Loewy called the diffusible substance the Vagus Stoff. And we now know that the Vagus Stoff is acetylcholine and that it is acting on a particular type of acetylcholine receptor called a muscarinic acetylcholine receptor, entirely different, as we'll see, from the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors these muscarinic acetylcholine receptors are instead activated, hijacked by the mushroom toxin muscarin. So in fact, many postsynaptic membranes contain G protein coupled receptors. Uh, there is a G protein coupled serotonin receptor, a G protein coupled muscarinic acetylcholine receptor, which we just described, and a G-protein coupled dopamine receptor. They are on the receiving end of synapses. So here we have a presynaptic terminal 
containing serotonin, one containing acetylcholine, one containing dopamine, and these are diffusing to activate their G-protein coupled receptors. So this is synaptic transmission as we've seen, but as we will see, it's a bit slower and more diffuse than the little chemical hop that we've described up until now. Several small molecule transmitters serve as agonists for both ligand-gated channels and G-protein coupled receptors. Among vertebrates, acetylcholine activates nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. GABA, we call the ligand-gated channel the GABA-A channel, so that ligand-gated channel that I've been describing to you for the past few lectures is actually more precisely called GABA-A. And the GABA-B receptor is the G-protein coupled receptor. Glutamate has an ionotrophic glutamate receptor, which I've described to you, and a metabotropic GPCR. Serotonin has one lone gene, the 5-HT3 receptor, and about seven G-protein coupled receptors. And then among invertebrates, there are also ligand-gated channels that are activated by other transmitters, not among vertebrates. Uh, and uh, among vertebrates, there definitely are GPCRs activated by histamine and dopamine. So this is a very widespread system. Now, I do want to remind you that on a time scale of seconds and perhaps minutes, the language of the nervous system is still electricity. And we are still describing a set of mechanisms that manipulate impulse frequencies in individual neurons, but it's done entirely differently by GPCRs. The plasma membrane components of the G-protein pathway are described in this image. Uh, here is a recent X-ray crystallographic structure that is actually a more, much more realistic version of the schema that I've put here. The neurotransmitter or the hormone binds to the, binds to the receptor, the G-protein coupled receptor. Here is the hormone uh, schematized. This bright color is the hormone in real structure. The receptor always has seven transmembrane domains. The receptor contacts the G protein, which contains three different subunits, cleverly called alpha, beta, and gamma. You'll notice that the beta is drawn as a type of propeller structure, and it's light blue in this crystal structure here. The alpha, sort of yellowish here in the scheme, sort of dark yellow in this picture. And the gamma subunit is uh, here. So when the neurotransmitter or hormone binds to the receptor, it activates the G protein. Usually the G protein is anchored in the membrane by lipid tails. The G protein changes shape so that it liberates GDP, guanosine diphosphate, and binds GTP. The G protein then moves not very far, less than a micron certainly, and sometimes actually there's a complex containing all of these molecules, and activates an effector. The beta gamma subunits can also activate effectors, and all of this stays pretty close to the membrane because the G protein subunits remain near the membrane, and most effectors are also membrane proteins. The whole process gets stopped when the GTP that is bound to the alpha subunit gets hydrolyzed into GDP. So as you probably know, the universal energy currency of a cell is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. There is also a GTP that also has three phosphate bonds. And so GTP can carry energy and signals as well. And it gets hydrolyzed to terminate the action of the G protein. And the whole process can start again if the G protein can find an activated G protein receptor. Fairly complicated, 
took about 40 years to work out, involved about four Nobel Prizes. So what are some generalizations that we can make about the first part of the pathway, the G-protein coupled receptor itself? Well, all of them have seven alpha helices in the membrane. There are about a thousand G-protein coupled receptors in the genome. That is 5% of the 20, 25,000, 4 to 5% of the 20 to 25,000 genes in the genome are G-protein coupled receptors. Most are still orphans, that is, their ligands are unknown. Individual members of this family respond to perhaps a low molecular weight neurotransmitter, such as the ones we've seen, serotonin, dopamine, or acetylcholine. Others respond to a short protein, 8 to 40 amino acids, a peptide, such as endorphin. Others respond to a relatively water-insoluble lipid, such as anandamide, which is the endocannabinoid, the endogenous cannabinoid. Most G-protein recept coupled receptors actually are olfactory receptors, and they respond to an olfactory stimulus. And finally, in the eye, there are in our bodies four genes for rhodopsin. Each of them has retinal, a small molecule bound to it, in a position that looks very much like a low molecular weight neurotransmitter. Light photoisomerizes the retinal and produces a change in the structure of the receptor. And so the receptor goes on to activate a G protein. We can't talk in this course about D and E. We will mostly concentrate on A, B, and C. Well, now this is a complex pathway. What is the selective advantage of such a complex pathway? Mostly, the neurotransmitter or hormone does not directly influence the response. I haven't told you about the response yet. It's downstream. But it is not directly influenced by the neurotransmitter or the horm hormone, either from the viewpoint of chemistry, because the chemistry of the response, because the chemistry of the initial agonist receptor interaction is quite different from the ultimate chemistry that occurs inside the cell. Also, there is a decoupling of the speed. The initial agonist binding occurs within milliseconds, but it takes a fraction of a second to get the pathway activated. And also, there is a decoupling of localization. Within about a micron, the ultimate effects are not where the agonist has bound to, to the receptor. Now, all of this means very flexible pathways. but all, all of this amplification and indirect coupling also requires energy. And also, the amplification and indirect coupling limit the pathway in some ways with, res with regard to speed and also with regard to cooperativity. I know of no G-protein coupled receptors that have Hill coefficients of greater than 1. Next time, we'll delve into additional details of the G-protein pathway.